Hello and welcome everyone. Today we have with us Donald Yakman. Mr. Donald Yakman is a partner and portfolio manager of Yakman Asset Management. Several milestones in his long investing journey have been featured in prominent uh, media. Don started uh, Yakman, founding the company as its president, portfolio manager, and chief investment officer. Since the founding of the company, Don has been awarded the 1994 Portfolio Manager of the Year Award by Mutual Fund Letter. Don has also been nominated by Morningstar as Fund Manager of the Decade in 2009 and finalist for Morningstar's Domestic Stock Manager of the Year Award in 2011, as well as the Portfolio Manager of the Year Award in 1991. Don holds an MBA with distinction from Harvard. In a recent interview about his investing philosophy, Don described his process of buying above average businesses at below average prices. He compared these businesses to a beach ball being pushed under the water. Eventually, the key is to wait long enough for this process to occur, where they rise to the top. In speaking with Don, uh, we met just shortly before the talk, uh, and learning about his experiences, I think there's a lot to Don uh, more than just investing and to learn from his rich experiences about. So we are very delighted to have Don in person with us today to share more about his investing and personal philosophy. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Donald Yakman. Thank you. Thanks. It's good to be with you today. Um, I think about the only thing that wasn't included is that uh, I'm a Cubs fan. So, uh, uh, as you know, the Cubs haven't won the World Series since 1908. So we have a phrase, and that is that anybody can have a bad century. Um, which reminds me, uh, you know, some of my kids probably think I was at that World Series in 1908. I really wasn't. I just want to make that clear. In fact, I wasn't even at the last time they went there, which was 1945. But I am reminded of these two elderly gentlemen who uh, were chatting with each other, and one of them said to the other one, he said, uh, he said, my memory is starting to go. And the other one said, he said, I've had that problem too. He said, but I went to the doc and he gave me some meds, and he says, they really seem to be working. He said, just can't remember the name of the meds. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 thorns, uh, flowers, uh, bushes. Uh, you know, red and yellow and white and pink. And the other guy looked at him and he said, Rose. He said, that's it, Rose, what's the name of that medicine? <laughs> so I haven't quite hit that point yet. Um, today I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit uh, about some of my uh, background and how I got into the investment field and a little bit about my, uh, my history before we go through the process and so on. Um, I haven't done that before, but I thought it might be kind of interesting, and I know there was some interest in that. Both of my parents um, came out of poverty situations, and um, my father's side, my grandfather left the scene before he was five. He ended up going back to Poland for a couple of years, and, or f about five years, and lived in dirt floor, straw bed, so he became pretty impoverished. My mother's father passed away with a stroke uh, or cerebral hemorrhage uh, when she was like nine, and so she also uh, didn't have a father in the home. Um, by the time I was born, my father uh, was an entrepreneur and had and been pretty successful, even though neither my mother or my father uh, went to post high school, really, very little. My mother managed the office, and so they, they both did they were both hard chargers, if you will, and, and uh, worked hard and um, I think set a good example in, in a lot of ways. Uh, they divorced, unfortunately, when I was eight. Uh, I moved out to Salt Lake City and uh, grew up there. Uh, and, and I know this is probably not politically correct, but when I was 15, I joined the Mormon Church. And in my mind, that was the best decision I've ever made. And a lot of people say, well, how can that be? You know, you, what about your wife and your, your, your decision? And I said, well, you got to remember, that wouldn't have happened had the first one not happened. So, uh, by the way, my wife and I just celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, last month. 
Uh, she and I were born in the same hospital in Chicago, nine days apart. And in those days, uh, women were in for 10 days, so I kid her about the wink she gave me in the nursery. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> one of the other things that, that becomes important, why that, that comment of mine is relevant, is when I was 19, I'd just finished my first year of, of college. And in that period of time, that was 1960, um, the, Ger the Russians had sent up a Sputnik, and so anybody who was good in math and science was really encouraged to go into engineering, and that's what I thought would be my field. But that summer, uh, in our church, young men are uh, given the opportunity to serve missions for two years, go out and, and do missionary work. And they changed the age from 20 to 19, which meant that I could go, and so I did right away. And after two years, of being on that mission, I really came back with a totally different feeling about what I wanted to do career-wise. And uh, really felt I wanted to work more with people, not that engineers don't. I mean, I realize a lot of you probably are engineers and work with people all the time. But it just, in, in other words, it was a, a different look that I had of the world, if you will. And I went back and I looked at an interest exam that I'd had when I finished high school. And in that interest exam, I found out that I was only about a 32 percentile in engineering, but I was like a 92 percentile in business. And I thought, you know, maybe there's a message here. So I remember I thought, well, you know, this MBA sounds like I ought to get that MBA. That sounds like a good idea. And so I went to the, some of the counselors and they said, well, don't get a business undergraduate degree. They want you to have more rounded uh, uh, career, or I mean, a more rounded education. So I thought, well, I'll go to the nearest thing, which was uh, economics, I thought. And uh, so I majored in economics in my, uh, my undergraduate work, and then went on and got an MBA. By the way, I don't know if any of you know what the definition of an economist is. Do you know what that is? That's an accountant without a personality. So. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I got my MBA and then uh, have been basically pretty much working in this business uh, throughout my career. And, uh, and over the years have kind of developed in, in a, a style that uh, I feel very, very comfortable with. Uh, we've been very fortunate, um, not, not only on the business side, but on the personal side. We have seven children. We have 22 grandchildren. Um, and it's quite a brood. And, We'd like to have them over on Sundays a couple times a month and have dinner together. And it gets a little hectic and a little noisy, but it, it's enjoyable. Anyway, that's a little bit of the personal side. Um, so one of the things that I, I thought I'd do is, is go through the kind of the process with you. As was already mentioned, um, this is kind of one of the quotes that people, my kids tease me, by the way, on, on what they call my dadisms or my little quips, that, uh, and this is one of them. We like to buy beach balls being pushed underwater with the water level rising. I think, to me, I'm a conceptual thinker. I like to create mental pictures, and I think that tends to help us understand the process of investing a lot easier. The next thing I want to do is talk a little bit about investment goals, which leads up to the process. I wish I could tell you that over the last roughly almost 50 years now of investing, um, that I, I did everything in a great orderly fashion. It just doesn't work that way, you know. Uh, we, we tend to kind of meander our way, I think, a lot of times through life. I've told the younger guys, I, hopefully I've saved you 10 or 15 years of, of um, wandering in the wilderness, if you will. Um, so it, it, I think it, but again, this is, this is where I've ended up with it in the process. And let's talk a little bit about these goals. The first goal is to protect clients' money. We feel that's really, really important. And there are two things, though, that are important, and they, they kind of counterbalance each other a little bit. One is protect against making dumb decisions, in other words, losing the money permanently. Anytime you're investing in securities, there's, there's a degree of fluctuation. Most big companies, by the way, if you look at their 52-week ranges fluctuate as much as 50% from low to high over a 12-month period. You'd be surprised. So what we don't want to do is, is permanently lose the capital. The second thing, though, and that's, 
you could, in effect, say, well, I could stick it under a mattress and do that. But you really can't in a world where you have paper money, and that means inflation. If you look at the last roughly 100 years, it's averaged about 3% a year. Now, just to give you an idea, that will take a dollar to a nickel over, over a 100-year period. Over uh, you know, other periods of time, it'll be different. We've had as much as 4% over long periods of time inflation. So I don't know what it'll be in the future, but I know it's inevitable. That's the bottom line. It is inevitable. And so in order to protect capital, we need to be proactive and invest it. And, and if you look at the numbers, they're pretty clear that equity investing provides the higher rates of return. Now, you could say backdoor equities like junk bonds or something like that, but they're really equities in disguise. So equities, bonds, cash, you know, you've seen the numbers over the years, I'm sure. And... Uh, they're there. So the other side is to grow the money. And growing the money, we want to get equity returns, so we want double-digit returns. But the other thing we want to do <clears throat> is, is measure ourselves over a period of time that's appropriate. And we feel the real way to measure yourself is over a very long time frame or from one market peak to the next market peak. Um, that's the toughest time period, I think, to evaluate. Uh, managers and the problem is is sometimes you have these very long time frames uh, in order to do that but it, when you do that I think you really get a better look unfortunately they don't work out at nice calendar year type events uh, but I, I still think that's the best way to look at it so with that in mind how do you invest money <clears throat> and we're going to talk about each one of these three things uh, in the investment strategy First one we'll take is, is good business. And several years ago, I, I thought about this and thought that there was really a way to look at maybe create a grid and then position, um, position every company on this grid or the, the components that make up a company so that one could really get an idea what the business model was all about. Because ultimately, this business boils down to what you buy and what you pay for it. So the business model is very, very important. And in analyzing the business model, you'll notice that there are certain things that make sense to us. And what we're looking for are businesses that have what I call high rotas, return on tangible assets. And as an example, we put in here, or I put in here, four different categories. And that category, the one that hit, hits the jackpot, if you will, or the consumer staples, you think about it, these kind of businesses um, where they can have a, a product or a service that's relatively disposable and low price so it's used up on a regular basis has an edge because they can, they can manage their capital much more efficiently. They can keep it, keep it working all the time. And so when you can keep the capital working all the time, and particularly if you have a high market share, you can make a lot of money. Um, a company that has a 40% share of the market doesn't make twice what a company has a 20% share of. They'll make four times as much. So having more, a big market share is also important, as well as having a low-cost position. But they all start to come together if you think about it. All those things will start to work together. Um, Years ago, I, I, before the meeting, I, I was talking a little bit, and I started talking about comparing two, two businesses that were basically no-growth businesses for decades, in the automobile business and the cigarette business, and Philip Morris and General Motors. But if you look at the business models, they're night and day different, even though they're in both in virtually no-growth business. And so as a result of that, Philip Morris has been a spectacular investment. General Motors went bankrupt. Um, so over a long period of time, you start to see the impact of this. I guess the ultimate is, this, is the fellow who went to his 25th class reunion for the Harvard Business School. And uh, he walked in and he said, Joe, we haven't seen you for 25 years. Where have you been? And he said, well, he said, you know, I... I barely got in here. He said, I had to work and work and work just to graduate. 
He said, so I knew I couldn't compete with you guys in your fancy jobs in consulting and finance in Boston and New York. He said, I went back to a little town in Illinois that I came from. He says, but we did develop this little product and we did patent it. And he said, uh, you guys probably use it every day. He said, we make it for a dollar and we sell it for four. I said, you'd be amazed how that 3% adds up. <laughs> Now, he may not have got the math right, but he got the concept right, okay? <laughs> That's a good business when you can have that situation. Contrast that to businesses that are over here in the capital goods area. Not that there aren't some businesses that have done well, but I was thinking the other day, like John Deere, for instance, is an example. Many years ago when I was looking at the tractor business, I think the life cycle is like 17 years for tractors. How would you like to be in a business where somebody bought your product every 17 years? Okay, think about that versus somebody who makes toothpaste. Okay, it's a lot different situation. The airline business, a lot of people have talked about how bad the airline business is and how it hasn't made any money since the Kitty Hawk. I think it, at one time uh, the airline business uh, it took a dollar of capital to generate 40 cents of revenue. That's just not a good business, okay? But again, it's a matter of looking at the total composition of the business, in my mind. In other words, one really needs to understand what they own. What kind of business? Is this the kind of business that makes sense? Is it a good business, ultimately? So some of the characteristics are listed there. Uh, but you, again, we've talked about them. Now, sometimes you can go kind of in between where you have uh, something more ad-driven, like a media business, where there's more, more uh, economic sensitivity but low capital requirements. There also may be ease, more ease of entry in the business. Because of that, service businesses tend to have that characteristic. Or the other way, where you have more capital required, uh, like a, a utility type model, uh, and some of those will work. Uh, but remember, like in the utility model, the only way to get your ROE up, because you have a low ROA, is to, to leverage it. You have steady cash flows, hopefully. Uh, but if you have a real downturn, like a period like the Depression was, there were a lot of utilities that ended up going bankrupt in the, in the, uh, in the 30s. So um, that's an example. Now, the second, whoops. We talked about, well, we can talk about winners and losers. Um, we've talked a little bit about that with the GM and the, and the, and the uh, Philip Morris part. By the way, I, I remember after I left uh, and started my own company, as I was leaving, I'd been at Selected Financial for about ten, nine years, nine years, a little over nine years. And um, eight and a half years, I'd run the selected American fund, and it was the fifth best performing fund in the country. And then I'd gotten the Morningstar Manager of the Year Award and stuff. But anyway, to, to, um, uh, to help me remember, uh, to be modest, I remember the people in the office, it was tied in with a brokerage firm, and uh, they gave me two t-shirts. And one of them had winners, and the other one had losers on the back. And there were about 10 of each, <laughs> so helps us keep humble. One thing about this business, by the way, if you're in the investment business, to, to remember, and that is basically you're almost always wrong to some degree, okay? Nobody buys everything at the bottom and sells everything at the top. It just doesn't work that way. So it's a business to stay humble in. Next one is, is the investment process uh, of the shareholder, uh, or I mean of the management of the company. And conceptually, if you think about what you're doing when you buy a piece, uh, an equity, is you're buying two cash flows generally. One is the cash flow that is given out as form of a dividend, and the other is the cash flow um, uh, that is that is retained by the management and reinvested in your behalf. That's the wild card. And as the longer term your investment horizon is, the more important that part of the investment equation becomes because it can, it can affect rates of return over long periods of time. In, in a way, think of it just like you'd think of a stock as a bond, and that's the way we think of it. 
and we'll come to the valuation and talk about that in a minute. Um, but here, let's talk about the reinvestment process because that's what's left by, left over after the dividend is paid. And the management team really has five basic options uh, with the, with the money that management uh, uh, or with the, with the management retained money. The first one is to put it back in the business, R&D, marketing, cost reductions, distributions, on and on and on. And trust me, if you have a great business and you can grow model and you can grow units in that business, it's wonderful. The rate of return, the marginal rate of return on new incremental growth is really, really excellent. And so it's a very important part and I would never minimize that. The problem is, is as companies start to get past their infancy, they start to generate excess cash. And usually they can't absorb all the cash that they are generating in their existing business. So they have to start examining four other options. We've talked about one of them, which was a dividend, and the obviously one of them is just sitting on it. But there are two others that they tend to look at too. And the next one is the one that's so difficult, and that is making acquisitions. And too many times, unfortunately, the egos override the economics in when, when acquisitions are made. And I think the classic on this one is if you go and look at a company uh, uh, that's now part of Pepsi, but before that it was Quaker Oats. Uh, Bill Smithberg was the CEO of Quaker, uh, Quaker Oats, and he, he actually showed both extremes, if you will. The first one is he went and he bought Stokely Van Camp. Now, Stokely Van Camp was in the canned vegetable business. They had some food chemical business, and they also had one little product called Gatorade. Well, what he really wanted was the Gatorade. And eventually, after he bought it, he liquidated the other pieces, and he was left with, with Gatorade, which was worth billions of dollars by the time Pepsi purchased the company and has continued to be a very valuable product line uh, for PepsiCo. Then, in the 90s, he went out and he bought Snap, Snapple. Excuse me. He had attempted to buy it once before and hadn't gotten it, so he paid up this time, paid like a billion and a half for it, and then realized the distribution was not tied in with the other pieces of the company. Uh, it didn't work out very well, and they ended up selling it and losing a billion dollars in the process. And so it was a disaster. It cost him his job. So that gives you kind of the extremes, the winner and loser uh, aspects of that. The third one is buying back stock, and here at least you know what you have. You're just buying a bigger piece of the pie, so to speak, so that the shareholder who's left has a bigger share uh, of the earnings as a shareholder. So those are the five basic options. Again, back in the, put money back in the business, acquisitions, uh, purchase stock, their own stock, uh, pay a dividend or sit on it through reducing debt or raising cash. Those are the things that are important to analyze. Now, and we've talked about the, the winner and loser here. Now let's talk about the investment strategy <coughs> of purchasing price. Um, the way we look at it is like, is think of it in terms of a forward risk adjusted rate of return. In other words, take into account the best you possibly can when you're looking at a business, the pieces in most cases, the, you have a dividend, and you should know what the dividend is when you buy it, and you should have a pretty good handle on your reinvestment rate, historical reinvestment rate. So the wild card in investing is what the management does with the money, that when we've talked about those options. And that's the one that requires some effort. Now, that'll, in effect, what you'll end up with is starting to look at ranges of outcomes, because nobody can predict the future with absolute certainty. And the more predictable the business, the narrower the range is, the less predictable, the wider the range is. And that has implications also on sizing because as, as your probability goes up and you feel more comfortable with the, the investment, both from a valuation and from a business model standpoint, the more money one should focus in on. And so the best, the biggest holdings 
should be in the, the companies that, uh, where you have the most confidence in. So I tell anybody if they look at our portfolio, well, what do you like the best? Well, just start with the one we have the biggest holding in. And when you have less confidence, you should have, and you have a wider range of outcomes, in effect, it's sort of like being a wildcat oil driller. You want to spread your risk. And so you put a smaller percentage into those holdings. But the ultimate is, is, is to find as many as you possibly can of great businesses at a low purchase price or a reasonable purchase price and hold them for a long period of time and have patience. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of sometimes how long that patience can be, uh, back in 2000, uh, we bought a company called Lancaster Colony. Lancaster Colony, about 90% of their earnings uh, eventually became in specialty foods, half the grocery store and half uh, uh, through the uh, retail, or I mean through, uh, through restaurants. Uh, things like um, Sister Schubert's rolls, my kids love those uh, rolls, they're frozen rolls. Um, Marzetti's dips and salad dressings, those are the biggest part. But they, they are heavily dependent on soybean oil and so uh, we have been so brilliant as a, as a country as to tie in the cost of food with the cost of energy because 40% of the corn crop is used to make ethanol. How dumb is that, right? So um, anyway, as a result of that, the price of, of soybean and corn tend to line up with the price of, of oil to some degree. And so this company, for instance, was getting squeezed as the price of oil went up after that period of time into the mid-2000 period. But as oil peaked out and started to decline and the market declined in 08, the this company had by this time had been squeezed enough they started to raise prices and the, their costs went down and their earnings exploded and this stock actually went up while the market went down, just to give you an idea. So it, it sometimes it takes a long period of time for the final things to work out the way you'd like them to work out. Um, but the key point is, is have patience. Have a very long horizon time and have patience. Well, I, um, I think we're kind of at this point in time where we're, we're let's see, I don't know if my, yeah, my time is about right, actually. Um, before I open it up for Q&A, though, I want, to, uh, I want to tell you a little story about the, the money manager that went around uh, with his assistant. And um, he went around and they would talk and the, the assistant kept hearing him talk and give his spiel. And finally, after many, many times, the assistant looked at him and he said, you know what? He said, I have heard you deliver that message so many times now. He says, I think I could do it as well as you do. So they said, well, let's try it the next place. So they reverse roles and the assistant went up there. He delivered the message just brilliantly, just like the money manager. At which point he opened it up for Q&A. And the first question right out of the box was, Mr. Money Manager, what do you attest your positive alpha to? Is it your low beta or your low standard deviation? At which point he looked at his money manager and he said, you know what? He said, that question is so easy, I'm gonna have my assistant answer it. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, I'll open it up for some questions that you may have. One thing I wanted you to touch upon, if you can, is you mentioned the importance of patience. But, uh, you know, there's a little bit of contrarianism in going on your own. And when those uh, beach balls have not really risen to the top, and everybody else is looking at you uh, with doubt, uh, have you been in such a situation? How, how has that felt like? I just wanted you to talk a little bit about the psychology of things because you mentioned this in your previous interviews. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the fat pitch right over the heart of the plate. <laughs> As a baseball analogy. Um, yeah, that certainly happened to us in, in uh, going into 99 and 2000. Um, and, and you know maybe that's a, that's another thing. I, I you know my my personal life I, I think helps strengthen that whole situation because 
we're on the, I view us on this earth as to having more than just to be out here to make money. And I think to provide service and do other things for people and to be involved in a family. And uh, so, uh, you know, that, I think that really helped in that period of time. But I think it's really important to stay focused um, and to be patient. Uh, my kids, again, I, they tease me about my dadisms. One of them is there's a narrow difference between being determined and stubborn. If at the end of the day you're right, you're determined. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, but I and I and I think that long horizon time really does make a difference, and it separates us. Really does separate us from so many people out there. Uh, and I, I think that's something that value managers, I think, really do have more. But there's tremendous pressure in this business. Tremendous pressure for short-term results. I remember when I was traveling once and I looked at a, a USA Today and it talked about horizon time and virtually nobody has more than a three year horizon time. And yet I will tell you that there are periods of time where we can go three years and underperform the market. It's not, not that difficult really if you're using this kind of a strategy to have a period like that. And that's why that peak to peak really makes a difference. I'll tell you what's critical is to think of it in terms of like you're a CFO of a company. And if you can buy things above your cost of capital, then you should be buying. And so like when 08 and 09 hit, a lot of people said, well, how could you do well in both periods of time? Well, if you, if you can find opportunities, it's sort of like playing chess or playing war, if you will. You always want to move forward, okay? Uh, and in, in an 08, we were fully invested before the market bottomed. Uh, and, and then the market went down another 20%. I remember telling people at Christmas, I said, if you can't, if you can't, uh, uh, if, if you're a value investor and you can't find things to buy today, there's, there's a disconnect, okay? <laughs> and then it went down 20% more. So you cannot call that. But what you can do is feel very comfortable and think of it in terms of using your cash reserves and then having the things that are very high quality, your AAA bonds, if you will, of your portfolio, the highest quality stocks, that will tend to hold up better in that environment. You can start to let some of those go and then re-encycle that money into things that have been crushed that are really excellent businesses, but they may be a double A or a single A, but they have a lot more upside potential and be willing to shift those where you can dramatically increase your rate of return uh, in the investments you have. So I hope, does that answer your question? Yeah, you mentioned the 1999-2000. Could you maybe describe the situation? What was the setting? What were you alluding to? Well, I mean, in, in, I, mean I even wrote in a report, uh, a couple of reports actually to shareholders. Uh, one was that, you know, you know anybody because this was the dot-com period, and a lot of this was people uh, were selling things over the internet uh, for 75 cents that cost them a dollar. Well, I mean, I could go out on the street and give away dollar bills for 75 cents. I wouldn't have any trouble getting rid of them. Okay, that's, that's possible, but it doesn't make any sense. The, the whole thing didn't make any sense. By the way, I remember I, I used Neutrogena soap, no ad intended here. Um, and I bought about $100 worth of Neutrogena soap from one of those guys and uh, one of those websites, uh, several year supply because it was such a bargain. But, <laughs> but my, uh, again, my kids tease me about my bargain hunting too. That's another thing I will tell you in this business. If you go into a, a value manager's office and it's opulent, there's probably a disconnect there too. Because <laughs> most value managers do not have opulent uh, offices. Don, what were you buying in 99 and 2000? Well, it's interesting because in that period of time, there were, there were kind of two things. That, there, there, there were some things that were crushed. Um, and uh, one of those that we, we mentioned was, was Philip Morris that had a suit in, in Florida. I don't use the product, but, but um, they, uh, uh, th it was just one of the things that struck me about this is that there is a, uh, a fellow who's on the board, you may, may have heard of him, named Carlos Slim. And Carlos Slim is one of the wealthiest men in the world. And Carlos Slim actually bought some Philip Morris right near the bottom 
at that period of time with his own money. Now, there's a lot of reasons why people will sell stock if they're insiders, but there's only one reason they'll use their own money to buy stock, okay? Only one reason. Um, but the other thing that happened is a lot of the really big companies, good businesses, were very overpriced. I mean, like Coca-Cola, it, it basically, it, even today it's only barely passed, uh, recently it passed its, um, it's the high it hit in 1998. Five years or seven years later when we were buying it, uh, it was less than half that. So these, these companies go through these really odd valuation periods. But we ended up buying a lot of smaller companies, middle-sized and smaller companies, because they, those were where the bargains were in, in that period of time. Um, uh, one of them I remember uh, being on a, on a phone call in 1998 with, uh, uh, with a famous money manager that I won't reveal his name. Uh, he's more of a momentum-driven, uh, growthy or kind of guy. Although, to me, uh, growth and value are joined at the hip. I mean, to me, it, it, it's just like looking at risk-adjusted forward returns and bonds. But anyway, so he picked Pfizer, and we had just sold Pfizer. <laughs> And that was uh, when the little blue pill came out and uh, the stock went way ahead of itself. And uh, we bought a company called First Data, which eventually went, uh, went private. But we later bought Pfizer back about five, seven years later um, at a lower price than what we'd sold it at. And in the meantime, I think First Data tripled. So. It's a matter of also being flexible and being willing to look at the world in an objective way. Thank you, Mr. Dong. Mm -hmm. uh, can you compare the, the Amazon and the Apple with the strategy you are talking about? I think both companies are very good companies in terms of the business you are talking about, but they have very different investment strategy. And uh, Apple holds uh, tons of cash and uh, Amazon just uh, badly earned in the last quarter. Um, okay, the, I know Apple, what's the other one? Amazon. Amazon, Amazon. Amazon. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, they're, they're very different. They're very different companies, totally different. Uh, my, 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 my worry with Apple, frankly, uh, and we actually talked about this a little before the meeting too, uh, and I've been wrong in the short term, but Clayton Christensen, who's at Harvard Business School, um, uh, I remember after I, having commented about Apple's strategy, he lined up right with me. Here's the problem I see. I think, I think their strategy is designed for a niche type market. And I think in the long term, the company that has the bigger market share and the lower cost position has a much more stable situation. Now, it's, it's tough in technology because you have a lot of shooting stars and everything, but I think they have unsustainable margins. I really do. And I mean, I think if you can get something that has 70, maybe 50 even, but 70, 80% of the same features for much less money for half the price or two thirds or whatever, um, it's just gonna work more. And I think the open architecture um, is a better way to go because it allows more uh, spread of costs and, and ultimately. So, you know, that, that's my dilemma that way. Amazon's strategy is very unique and it has, it has kind of this halo. Retailing's a tough business. Um, and uh, I, uh, at some point, you know, they're gonna have to make some money, but they've been, uh, what their strategy is, and it's, it's a clever strategy, is to just have virtually no margin and make no money to, to expand market share. But again, to some degree, it's a little bit like those dot-com companies, so to speak. At some point, you gotta make some money to develop the capital to, to feed it. Now, some of the way they've done it is because they're trying to move a little bit way of laying off more of the capital uh, and, and affect the inventory onto other people. And so they're gonna become more of a middleman uh, for that. So, you know, they have, I, I think it's a tremendous strategy but I would, uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's tough to justify the price that it's at to me. But ag again, it, it, it's still early, but they are, they are I, I think their market cap now is bigger than Walmart, as an example. Yes. So the dilemma in, in the growth stock strategy, if, if you 
so to speak, go that way, um, is that there's a lot more, um, a, a lot more attempt to evaluate the future, and it becomes much more difficult. That's the problem. I feel a lot more comfortable with more stability after things have shaken out somewhat, where where things are clear. But then I tend to lean more toward the AAA bond type model. Uh, to me, those are these are not AAA bonds, so to speak. They're a lot more risky, and uh, you're, you're making judgments that may not last. Companies just don't grow at high rates indefinitely. It's just, I mean, think about the you know anybody who's who's in statistics or mathematics, and most of you are obviously very good in this, those areas, or you wouldn't be working here. Uh, you can just see, I mean, otherwise you'd own the world, right? I mean, if, if you grew fast enough. So it just it mathematically doesn't work, I think, and that, that's what makes it a dilemma. But in the short term, remember, as, as I think it was, um, uh, as Ben Graham said, he said, in the short term, it's a voting machine, in the long term, it's a weighing machine. So I think the popularity, probably 70% of people are momentum investors. They're rear view of mirror investors. They, they buy what has been good with this, the idea that it's going to be better. You know, there's one company that made a, a career out of uh, saying, well, well, we'll buy things when they make an all-time high because they tend to run after that. You know, uh, very dangerous kind of, kind of strategy, I think. And, and let me give, you know, a lot of credit should go to Steve, my son, on that one, because uh, he did a lot of work on AmeriCredit. And uh, AmeriCredit, what was unique about AmeriCredit, uh, financial stocks, by their very nature, are low return on asset businesses, okay? So, uh, because they make their money through leverage, and that makes them very vulnerable. Now, what made AmeriCredit kind of unique, in more than one way, uh, from a business model standpoint. First of all, about 40% of their money they got back in the, in the first year. Number two is they had collateral. Now, the collateral tended to be about 40% if they had to repo the car. Third is people in today's world, uh, they tended to be not, not as many homeowners so that you didn't have the same overlap with people who were over leveraged in their home investment. These a lot of people were apartment dwellers and so on. Um, their problem wasn't the, the basic business model. Their problem was the freezing up of the capital markets. Because um, what they ended up having to do is they would, they would uh, collateralize these mortgages or, or package these mortgages and then sell them uh, as, a, as a collateralized uh, 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 debt piece. And so when the markets tended to freeze, they had to basically wait for the payments to come in before they could re-lend uh, the money. So at the worst case scenario, they were basically running at close to a break even. And the stock was, uh, had a book, and so the book was about $15 a share, 16 somewhere in there. Uh, and so that was, and it's hard to say in any financial stock that the book is solid, but as, as much as you could say, that was there. The other thing is psychologically, and you told somebody you were buying a a, uh, a used car uh, subprime auto lender, it was like it sent up all the flashes that you can imagine of negative characteristics to, to people in that environment. And so the stock went down to three, it was down to 20% of book at one time. GM actually bought the thing out because they had sold off GMAC and they bought it at like 23 uh, within uh, a couple of years after that. So. It, it, but again, from, it was a unique business model. I'm not enamored with, with um, uh, big uh, city money-centered banking kind of institutions. I mean, to me, the, the other side is look at um, how tough it was for Jamie Dimon to run Morgan Stanley when you have the whales show up. I mean, and here's a guy who's a brilliant operating man, still has something like that happen to him. It tells you how difficult it is to... Uh, uh, to deal with a bank like that. So be careful on financial stocks. Yes? I've heard some fund managers talk about they only have two good ideas a year, and they'll go big on those. And you talked about increasing your, your investment size when you have that kind of conviction. I'm questioning, I, I wonder, how do you come up with good ideas? 
How do I come up with? How do you come up with good investment ideas? How do you find them? They, and where they, where does it come from for you? Oh, I, I think they can come from any place. Uh, I think over the years, uh, to some degree, maybe it's a little bit like uh, uh, Potter Stewart, the Supreme Court Justice, when he was asked about uh, um, how he knows pornography, and he says, well, I know it when I see it. <laughs> you know, so I, I think after you do this so many years, you know, it's sort of like you can, within a matter of minutes, you can look at something and say, yeah, that one looks really good, okay? But um, based on the, the place you are in the, in, the, in the market cycle and, I mean, valuation levels and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variables to take into account. But I think, I think one of the best ways is to, uh, is to look at things that have problems, short-term problems. There are really three um, opportune times to make purchases. One of them is when the market goes down. And when the market goes down, think of these as like a wind coming through uh, an orchard and some fruit then drops to the ground. It's very easy to look at it, okay? So it can be, it can be like a, a situation where the whole marketplace collapses like it did in 08, 09. I mean, that, that was a dream come true where you have an opportunity like that. I remember walking into the board of directors of our funds in, uh, in late October, and one of the fellows who was a classmate of mine at Harvard Business School, and he said, he said, man, it must be really tough out there. And we're kind of dancing in the streets. I mean, literally, you know, kind of like, oh no, this is great. You know, so some part of that's a mentality thing, and it's just getting uh, used to looking at things in an objective way. So market going down is one. Second one is an industry shortfall. And like the classic of this one would have been 1993 when there was a concern at that point about changing the healthcare industry dramatically when the Clintons first came, or the Clinton came into office. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not go there, okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, I think we ended up with like a third of the portfolio in either drug or hospital supply companies. They were just kind of beaten up and just one after another after another. The difference was the, uh, between then and like a closer period like now is the drug companies um, had a much bigger pipeline and so there were a lot more uh, companies that were more interesting. Uh, the third one is where you have an individual uh, stock that, that's knocked down but it's temporarily out of favor. I referred back in 98 to the first data thing. Uh, first data had made a purchase of another company, they they process um, the, uh, the 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 payments for credit card companies and and merchants, and they had made a purchase, and as a result of that, they were assimilating this company, and you had a temporary kind of flattening out. I think it was more than anything of, of the earnings. So whereas been they the marketplace had been used to this, and they had this, they all of a sudden said, "Uh oh, big problem." wasn't a big problem, it was just an assimilation problem. And so it created a great buying opportunity. So those are the three kind of things to look at. I remember many, many years ago, a guy coming to my home and we were talking about investing and he said, that he, was, he was just a, 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 in contracting business. And he says, I do mine by looking at the new Lowe's list in the paper, the newspaper. I thought, well, that guy has got <laughs> some savvy. Not that I would choose that as the only source, but um, in other words, you, you, you know, you look for opportunity, and that's when a lot of times you're going to get it is under one of those three conditions. Thanks. Question? Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing um, your stories. Um, so you just spoke about uh, you look for opportunity. Um, what happens when you don't find enough opportunities? How comfortable are you holding cash, or would you just double down on what you have, let's say in the more, uh, as Graham calls it, the unpopular large companies and just waiting out for the dividends? How do you think about that problem? Yeah, cash, cash is, um, should be, is, it's a residual. But again, one needs to take into account when you think about having cash, it shouldn't be because you're trying to predict the market, okay? In other, words, in other words, if you can find things above your cost of capital, regardless what the market level is, one should do it. Think of it this way. If I, if I have a, 
if I'm a, a, in need of a new shirt and I go out and I see one that I like on sale, I buy one, okay? But then I go into the store again a week or two later and it's marked down another 20%. Should I dispose of the one I have? No, okay? If, I'm, if it's the kind of shirt I'm gonna wear and I'm gonna wear for a long time and I enjoy wearing, I should buy another one, okay? So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think the use of cash is, it becomes important when you have the opportunities there. But if you don't have opportunity, then sometimes you're better off just to sit on it and let it be, just wait for those opportunities. Because again, you have enough fluctuation in the marketplace that you're gonna get opportunities. It may be varied opportunities. It may be just a little addition to what you already have, or it may be a new addition. It could be either, uh, but that, that's the way I would view it. Um, again, I would be as aggressive as you can. Now, the other thing to take into account, and today we have a very unique situation, because in, when I look at the marketplace and I look at the categories, the one that seems to be even more overvalued than stocks if you're looking at overall valuations, are the bonds, the long-term bonds. I mean, you can get dividend yields on some of the high-quality companies that's higher than 10 or 30-year treasuries. Well, why on earth would I want to own something that has no increase in the, in the dividend, so to speak, uh, like that relative to the other? But it's a relative thing, okay? And when cash, at least in 07, you could make, you know, you had some decent interest on cash. Today, you get no money on cash. So it pressures people to lower their cost of capital to some degree to take that variance into account because there's such an enormous spread in the rates of return on a forward risk-adjusted basis. Uh, you know, for those of us who might be personal sort of individual investors, um, what general advice do you have in terms of you know, protecting your wealth and maybe growing it? Well, again, patience. I would highly <laughs> emphasize patience. I think the other thing is, is find a strategy that you can live with and stick with it, okay? Um, every, if, if I, just from a personal standpoint, um, I started out uh, in 1968 and for every year thereafter basically, when I would get money, uh, I, I put it in whatever firm that was, I'd put it in, the, the, in effect into the, uh, the market because I was getting it on a continual basis, looking at it as a very long-term thing. But think of it as a very long-term investment. Um, the, uh, the magic of compound interest is so important. So uh, uh, you know, be, be both protective but also be, uh, be aggressive at the same time. With that, thank you, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you here with us. Well, thanks. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. Sure. Thank you.